Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, the Atom Seminar has the great pleasure to welcome Professor Rodrigo Capaz. Uh, he received his bachelor's and master's degree in physics at the Pontifica Universidade Católica at Rio de Janeiro. And then he completed his doctorate at, in physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, and was a postdoctoral research associate also at MIT and then at the University of California at Berkeley and at Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, uh, where he is now a full professor of the Instituto de Física. Uh, Professor Rodrigo Capaz has experience in physics with emphasis in condensed matter physics, uh, working mainly on the following subjects, uh, graphene and 2D materials, carbon nanotubes, semiconductors, and surfaces. So once again, welcome Professor Rodrigo Capaz. Thank you so much for being here and please, please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Fred, for, for this invitation. Uh, to speak here at the seminar series is a very uh, nice one. I, I noticed the num name of people who spoke before me. It's really impressive and it's really great that you have this activity at, uh, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So let me uh, start by sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I, I just initially I want uh, to add uh, an information to to my uh, uh, introduction <laughs> that uh, I'm now uh, still at the Federal University of Rio, but presently I'm uh, acting as a director of the Brazilian Nanotechnology National Lab. Uh, since uh, like the last year or so, uh, and uh, the the plan for this presentation is actually twofold. To first, uh, in the first half, I will try to to describe to you and to present to you what uh, LN Nano, uh, our lab, is about, and uh, what uh, the possibilities of collaboration and, and interaction are. What are our facilities and how we work? And in the second half, uh, I will focus on a specific research uh, uh, a problem that we have worked in the past uh, in the past year and that we have recently published published which is uh, related to the rupture of ultra thin uh, ionic wires okay so let me start by describing to you uh, uh, what uh, the LN nano uh, is we are actually located in a larger center which is uh, CNPEN. CNPEN is the Brazilian Center for Research in Energy and Materials. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, an organiz organization uh, under the supervision of the Brazilian Ministry of Science and Technology, and it has four uh, different national labs in the same campus. So this is where I am right now. This is, this is LN Nano. Uh, this is our campus. Uh, but besides Ellen Nano, we have three other national labs. Oh, we are located in the city of Campinas, São Paulo. And uh, probably the most well-known is the LNLS, the Brazilian Synchrotron Light National Lab. It started here with the second generation uh, uh, synchrotron facility, but now it has a fully operational fourth generation synchrotron light source. Uh, well, not fully operational yet. We have uh, our, we have uh, eight beam lines already uh, working, uh, which is the series. And I uh, will talk a little bit about Sirius uh, in the next few slides. But besides LN Nano and, and Sirius and the LNLS, we have also the Brazilian Biorenewables National Lab and, and the Brazilian <clears throat> Biosciences uh, National Labs, LNB. So, uh, and here again, here is LN Nano. And it, this is a, a kind of unique R&D ecosystem within Brazil. And we try to work together uh, in a synergetic way in, in different uh, research areas, such as health, renewable energy, renewable energies, sorry, renewable materials, 
uh, agri-environmental and, and quantum technologies. Uh, let me briefly say a few words about Sirius because uh, I noticed that uh, people are really curious about it. Uh, uh, let me start by saying that Sirius is uh, uh, one of the uh, three uh, uh, fourth generation uh, synchrotron facilities operation in operation now in the world. The, the other one is the, the MAX-4 in Sweden, and there's another one in, in, in France. <clears throat> the first one is the, the MAX-4 in, in Sweden. Uh, this is some snapshots of uh, serious constructions. It started in 2014. Uh, and uh, in 2018, uh, the building was completed. Uh, and uh, this is a short movie. Uh, well, the idea is not to explain in detail about uh, synchrotron radiation, but uh, again, so we have a beam of electrons that go around uh, a ring. And every time an electron makes a curve, it emits uh, uh, radiation, which is called synchrotron radiation or, or synchrotron light, which can be in, in uh, several, in, in different wavelengths from the UV to, to X-ray. And, uh, and, and that's the, I mean, this is, move, this is a movie uh, going around the ring and then explaining a little bit how uh, 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 synchrotron light works. This is the, the electron, uh, packet uh, and uh, again it emits radiation and we use this light in these different beam lines to to do different kinds of experiments uh, using again from UV to, to x-ray sorry from infrared to, to x-ray uh, the phase one of Sirius uh, I think it's predicted to to have uh, I think 14 beam lines as I said, eight of them are already operational and they cover uh, different ranges of spectrum. And the idea is to cover different uh, uh, possibilities of investigating matter from biological matter to quantum matter. Uh, this is some technical details uh, of uh, the, uh, the different beam lines. They are acronyms uh, of uh, the techniques involved and they, they also uh, represent names of Brazilian uh, plants and, and animals. So uh, again, a short movie here uh, about the, the eight beam lines which are already operational. Uh, Carnauba uh, for biological, mostly for biological materials. Caterete for, again, 3D imaging of, of biological systems. Uh, EMA, it's a beam line for extreme materials of, or, sorry, extreme conditions, materials under extreme conditions of temperature and pressure. IP, it's a, a spectroscopy uh, of molecules, uh, mostly. IMBUYA, again, molecular spectroscopy with uh, uh, spatially nanometric uh, uh, resolution. So, this is, uh, okay, this is for Sirius. Now let me briefly talk in general about uh, CNPEN mission, which is also shared by LN Nano. We have a mission which uh, we divide into four different axes of activities. And the first axis, which I think it's the most important is that we are open facility to, 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 to outside users. So anyone in Brazil or abroad uh, who wants to use our facilities and can, he or she can submit a project and, and, and uh, apply for, for time and use it. So this is very important. This is in our, our DNA. Uh, the second axis is our uh, in-house in research that we do, as I said, uh, along this uh, 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 five different uh, research programs that I've mentioned before. Uh, we do support for innovations that we, we, inter we interact a lot with, uh, with uh, uh, industries in, 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 in different ways. Uh, if we perform services or you do joint projects with industry and we, uh, and, and the fourth axis is education and dissemination through our courses, our train, training. And uh, most recently we have actually, uh, uh, CNPEN has a uh, undergraduate uh, 
bachelor in science course, which is called uh, ILUM, that uh, maybe you have heard about. All right. So specifically, specifically about our lab, about LN Nano, it was created in 2011. So we have roughly slightly more than 10 years of operation. And in these 10 years, it has uh, uh, more than 6,000 external users have had access to, to our facilities. We are part of the CISNANO uh, system of uh, laboratories of nanotechnologies in Brazil. Uh, LN Nano is one of the strategic uh, labs of CISNANO. And uh, <clears throat> I, I could say it's probably the largest uh, of the labs and the one dedicated exclusively to, to, to nanotechnology. Uh, we have a not so large team of researchers. We have actually 15, now, now it's 16. We have we hired uh, recently another uh, researcher, uh, 16 researchers, uh, roughly 15 specialists. Specialists are also people with, with a PhD and postdocs and, and they have salaries which are uh, equivalent to the researchers, but the difference is they have slightly less academic freedom and they work uh, uh, mostly uh, related to a specific technique or, or facility trying to, I mean, uh, help external users to, and, and run the specific equipment and facilities. Uh, uh, besides that, we have about 20 technicians and three administrative support. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> LN Nano uh, has three different divisions, nanomaterials, nanobiotechnology, and devices. And the idea here is roughly to go through some of our uh, uh, facilities. Uh, I know sometimes it's very boring to show pictures of equipment, but the, the idea is really to, to let you guys know what we have. And, and again, emphasizing that we're open for collaborations and, uh, and projects from, from uh, external users. So we roughly serve about 600 external users per year before the pandemic. And this number is, is coming back to what it was before. Um, as I said, we have this uh, five different research areas on renewable energy, renewable materials, health, agro-environmental, quantum technologies. But we also do research on what we call transverse and enabling technologies uh, these are research to push the state of the art of these techniques. Uh, and we have in LNNO, we have, uh, we participate in, in four of them, electron microscopy, cryo, cryo EM, cryo electron microscopy for biological samples, micro and nanofabrication and uh, theory and data science. <clears throat> so roughly, uh, briefly uh, about our nanomaterials division, uh, the main, uh, I think, facility is the, our uh, microscopy center, which is probably one of the most uh, equipped ones with, within Latin America. Uh, we have a, a Titan with uh, 0.6 angstrom uh, resolution. Uh, these are some examples of, uh, uh, I mean, I mean uh, uh, recent work we have done within this facility. Uh, I will, in, in, in the second part of my talk, I will explain to you what this movie is about. But this is a, simply a recent uh, work on, on, on electron mic microscopy from our group, some recent uh, papers. Uh, we also have a, a, a lab of uh, scanning electron microscopy in, in duo beam with a, with a, with a uh, focused ion beam mic microscope. Um, we have a, a very large AFM facility with four different uh, AFMs uh, 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 working on, on different uh, types of, uh, of samples from biological samples to, to material science and physics and chemistry. <clears throat> LCIS is the in situ growth lab. Uh, this is actually in the same building as the Sirius. It's a lab for growing samples and uh, well, we, we can analyze them at, at the different beam lines at Sirius or within our um, microscopy center at El Anano, but you have, it has some growing capabilities of PLD, uh, post-laser deposition. We have two MBEs, one for, for metals, another one for 
for molecules and we have a STM AFM characterization tool all within the same vacuum uh, uh, tunnel. And we also have this vacuum suitcase to transfer the, the, the samples to series and other uh, characterization facilities. <clears throat> we have actually, of course, more simpler uh, uh, scattering and spectroscopy tools, uh, X-ray diffraction, XPS, Raman. Uh, we have a facilities for nanomaterial synthesis when we, we, we synthesize different types of nanoparticles, uh, metallic oxides, semiconductors, perovskites. Uh, we have a very strong uh, and active research line on, on green hydrogen, production of green hydrogen using both uh, electrolysis and photoelectrolysis. So we have a lab which is dedicated to photoelectrolysis, the photoelectrochemistry lab. Um, and uh, very much related to this lab, we have this nanoceramics processing uh, lab. So we do research on, on, uh, on different materials for new electrodes for both uh, 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 electrolysis and photoelectrolysis of water for hydrogen production. So this is very much related to the renewable energy program of CNPAM. Um, uh, the focus again is on green hydrogen, new nanomaterials for renewable energy and devices for renewable energy. These are some highlights of our recent uh, work. I'm sorry for going through that very fast. Um, <clears throat> and that's it for the nanomaterials division. Now, the devices division. The devices division, we have we do mostly nanofabrication and microfabrication of different types of devices. We have a, a roughly 200 meter, square meter a clean room uh, of uh, class 100, 1000, and 10,000. Uh, we have a, an e beam lithography, we have photolithography. Uh, this is our uh, ebin lithography machine, uh, which can write uh, patterns uh, with resolution less than 100 nanometers. We have a, a direct prototyping uh, uh, photolithography machine, and we do a lot of work on microfluidic uh, devices. Uh, we have strong collaborations with Petrobras on, on this area, on this microfluidic uh, devices built using our microfabrication facility. We also have <clears throat> uh, electro characterization tool, uh, PPMS equipment that can actually, it's a very good one that can go uh, in the millikelvin regime and magnetic fields up to 14 Tesla. And we also have, tech, we have an EPTEC MBE, EPTEXIAL growth uh, system that can do uh, three fires and conductors and we also can do, use that for doing 2D materials of group five and, and group three. So again, this is a, a highlights of our micro and nanofabrication program. Uh, some recent uh, work uh, from our lab. Um, we do a lot of work on also on sensors and biosensors for, for, uh, for health, for diagnosis and, and for biomonitoring. Uh, some recent work of our group. Uh, the key people there are Murilo Santiago, Matias Strauss, and, and Hannah Tulima, and Rafael Furlan. And finally, our nanobiotechnology division. Uh, <clears throat> in the nanobiotechnology division, we have a, a laboratory of nanotoxicology and nanosafety, and we do all sorts of uh, uh, um, uh, essays or, or uh, experiments on, on zebrafish model. I mean, we have different sort, uh, many, many, many uh, uh, companies, they, they come with different types of nanoparticles and they want to see what the uh, toxicology and environmental, uh, uh, possible environmental hazards of that. And we have a platform for doing that using the zebrafish model and different types of light scattering. Uh, Within the nanobiotechnology division, we have our cryo EM uh, uh, facility, which is, uh, I think was the first one in Latin America. We have two uh, cryo EM uh, microscopes, uh, and this is for doing biomolecular images. And these are again, some highlights uh, of research. Uh, a recent characterization of the Maiaro virus. This is a 
Brazilian virus, actually, uh, uh, Myaro virus at 4.4 resolution, a 3D image of that. And uh, this is a, a, another example of atomic model for the human septin nexum by cryo EM. Again, do, done here in our lab. <clears throat> uh, the nanobiotechnology division, it also has um, <clears throat> uh, research on the renewable nanomaterials, uh, mostly uh, uh, materials from biomass, nanocellulose, and uh, different types of polymers and compo composites. Uh, we have this uh, nanocomposites uh, processing lab, our renewable nanomaterials lab. And uh, again, the main teams are nanocellulose, uh, lignin cellulose interaction, and biomass-based uh, uh, materials and devices. And this is, again, some high of uh, high highlights of our recent uh, work on that. The key people are Matthias Strauss and, uh, and Juliana Bernardes and uh, Rubia Gouveia. And uh, finally, our nanoenvironmental lab, we uh, study the effects of uh, nano, nanoparticles in, uh, for agricultural applications and environmental uh, impact. And, uh, and once again, these are some recent results of uh, research on, on this field. And uh, I think the last part is our, it's actually the more recent uh, involvement of a center in quantum uh, technologies. Uh, we are actually uh, uh, planning to build a larger platform, uh, increasing our nanofabrication facility to be able to address and to be able to provide this facility to different users in Brazil, uh, working on quantum technologies, on, on, on photonics, on semiconductors. Uh, right now, what we have is actually uh, uh, research on quantum materials and quantum devices, uh, both theoretical and experimental. So these are some highlights of uh, our theory group uh, on different types of uh, uh, quantum materials, such as uh, topological insulators. And, and the key person to, to, to have in mind here is uh, Adalberto Fazio, who was the former director of, uh, CN, of uh, LN Nano, and he has now moved to be, he's still within CNPM, but he has moved to be the director of our uh, undergraduate uh, bachelor's in science uh, uh, program at ILUM. Some highlights of our theory and data science, we can do uh, molecular dynamics, uh, DFT calculations, machine learning methods, and, and electronic transport calculations. Uh, in the second part of my talk, I will uh, show some of the results of this, uh, employing these techniques to the, the particular problem uh, we worked uh, uh, on the rupture of uh, zirconium oxide uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, in the last year. And these are some highlights of uh, our theory and data science program. All right, so uh, I think this completes the first part of this talk. And um, hopefully, hopefully I will have some uh, like 20 minutes to go to the next part, which is describing the disintering and breaking of ionic nanoparticles. This actually, this is actually a joint uh, experimental and theoretical uh, collaboration within LN Nano. Uh, we have a theory group and experimental group, and this was just published uh, last month or this month, I think in PRL, so this is a very timely uh, occasion for, for, for this talk. Uh, and the, the first question is why we are studying the sintering and wire formation? Well, there's a fundamental aspect of it, which is to stu study the thermal stability of nanoparticles. And in, in, in this sense, sintering and the opposite process of sintering, which is the sintering, it's always comes about. Uh, the second, uh, reason is actually it allows us to explore the limits of our high resolution TEM machine uh, investigating atomic dynamics. So it's also sort of a proof of concept to, to see the, the formation of a, a single atom chain. And we do this for the first time for an ionic compound. Uh, 
And when we do that, it always uh, appears uh, new physics and, and new phenomena that uh, are interesting. So we do this, uh, we, we have through the history of nanotechnology, uh, many examples of this proof of concept uh, uh, experiments. First, you, you certainly remember the, the, the formation of the IBM symbol using individual atoms. And later in the 2000s, uh, the first uh, experiments on the formation of monatomic uh, gold uh, wires actually done here in this lab uh, at that time by Daniel Ogarty and, and collaborators. And also the theory of that was done by the people who are actually today now here at CNPEN, Jose Hockey, which is the general director and, and Alberto Fazio. So we have a long history of trying to uh, uh, form and break uh, monatomic wires here in our, in our lab. Uh, so the question is, uh, well, as, I, as I've shown before in the previous slide, uh, one can do uh, metals mostly 5D metals. And one can do also uh, a carbon chains, monatomic carbon chains, which is, this is a metallic system. This is a covalent system. Uh, usually these very long carbon chains are encapsulated within carbon nanotubes. And so the question is, is it possible to, to make such a monatomic wire for ionic systems? How about ionic chains? So it's, uh, it's not so easy because when you think about ionicity, it always comes together with brittleness, right? So this is actually a cartoon just to explain to you the, how uh, ionicity and brittleness come together in the sense that uh, uh, it's very hard. Uh, in, in other words, it's very, the, the atomic wire formation usually requires a very complex system, a sequence, sorry, of atomic rearrangement. And when you talk about an ionic system, uh, it's important to keep charge balance both at the, at the, for stability, no? uh, for stability to keep charge balance both at, at a global level and at local level. If you if you if you break charge balance locally, you start to to uh, create instabilities that eventually lead to to breaking of uh, of the system and without having the time and, and the pathway to, to form uh, an ionic, uh, a, a monatomic wire. So, well, you wanted to take this challenge and to see if it's possible to do that. And the system that we uh, uh, chose was the zirconium oxide, which is mostly ionic, but it's partially covalent. Uh, but the idea is that it was very handy to develop this very novel uh, uh, synthesis technique in which you start with uh, uh, encapsulated, uh, not, not encapsulated, with, with uh, zirconia nanoparticles that are surrounded by an organic uh, molecules, oleic acid. And, uh, <clears throat> and at some point, you, you, you took this to, to, to to the microscope and using the e-beam from the microscope, you start to remove this, these organic layers and eventually you, you form a very thin, a very thin layer, one or two uh, uh, nanoparticles thick layer of, uh, of uh, uh, zirconium oxide. And you start looking into that using your, your high resolution TEM and uh, Typically, the natural process, uh, once you increase the temperature, is to observe sintering, right? The, the, this is the natural, uh, is, this is where thermodynamics wants to, to lead you. But eventually, in some regions, there is a combination of, there is a situation of tensile strain that eventually leads to thinner and thinner bridges, and uh, it will eventually lead to rupture between two nanoparticles. And if you focus your attention here and analyze in more detail, so that's the idea, tensile stress promotes local disintering. And you, we will see that in a more, in atomic resolution in a minute. So, but the idea is that eventually they will break apart, right? And that's the process we want to understand. This is the process of disintering, which is the opposite process of sintering. So there is a classical theory of disintering which is very much related to the classical uh, plateau Rayleigh instability in liquids. 
that's the this is the um, a, a movie of uh, railing stability the idea is to have a falling stream of fluid uh, and eventually it becomes unstable and it prefers to break into a separate droplets than to to make uh, uh, a continuous uh, cylinder of fluid just because of surface energy uh, uh, arguments, just because of minimizing surface energy, which is in a liquid, it's equivalent to minimize surface uh, area, right? The surface area. Uh, so there's a classic theory of the sintering, which is very much based on these ideas, uh, saying that, uh, well, if you want to promote the sintering, you must have either uh, mass flux, I mean, removing material from this region or, and or, both can happen together, or you can have tensile stress in the sense that you, you are making this bridge uh, uh, a smaller, with a smaller width every time, and you change this uh, so-called dihedral angle, and there is eventually an instability. So, Eventually, there is a sudden and discontinuous instability from a certain situation where the two nanoparticles are adjoined together to another situation in which they, uh, again, discontinuously break apart. So this is the classical theory for the sintering. And, oops. The question is, is this picture valid at the nanoscale or the atomic scale? Can we observe this uh, uh, discontinuous instability or is it a completely different thing? Okay, let's see what the uh, microscope tells us. So let's do this experiment in the very final stages of the sintering. And one thing comes clearly to our, I mean, uh, it, we can, can, can clearly see first of all, the, which is the fact that this dihedral angle through the whole process is roughly constant. And this is very different from the classical disintering model. So we can see that you have very well-defined facets here. And, uh, and that's how the, the disintering process uh, comes about. It's very different from the classical one. And in the very final steps of disintering, we will see the formation of uh, uh, very small but uh, clear uh, monatomic uh, uh, wire. The, do the dark, uh, the dark, uh, sorry, let me run that again. So the dark spots here are zirconium atoms. We cannot see the oxygen atoms in this picture because they move very fast and we don't, we then don't have enough contrast. But I think you get the idea, right? So, uh, uh, you have very stable bridge. You don't see any discontinuity at all. You have very stable bridge until the very final steps of the sintering, which actually correspond to a formation of a, a single atom chain in the system. So why does that happen? Well, at the nanoscale, uh, surface energy is, is very different from a microscopic uh, system. Not only the area that matters, but the orientation the specific kind of surface orientation that you have uh, is very important. So you can see that from the Wolf construction that the nanoscale, the particles tend to keep well-defined surface orientation to minimize surface energy. And the same thing is happening here. So is this very different from a, a sphere? So it has very well-defined facets. And that introduces to us or gives us a constraint, which is again, the fact that this dihedral angle uh, is very much constant through the whole process. So the take home message is there's no instability at the nanoscale, the dihedral angles are roughly constant and monatomic wires are long lived uh, at, at, uh, at the uh, time scale of atomic movement, of course. Okay, let's see that in, in slightly more detail. Um, again, this is our snapshots of our, of our images. You, this is a measurement of the dihedral angle as a function of times. We show that the, it hardly changes. And the, so the question is, how can we explain this? This is uh, what I've, I've shown you before, uh, the classical explanation of the sintering with instability. And this is our proposal for, for the sintering at the nanoscale. 
So the key idea is that this dihedral angle must be, stay fixed, right? And the only way to move apart these two nanoparticles, imagine that you're moving apart, applying tensile stress and you're moving apart these two walls. The only way to keep this angle fixed is actually to invert the mass flux. Instead of uh, removing mass from this region, from the bridge region, you actually moving mass towards towards this region. So you have I mean, uh, this new situation here until you break. Uh, I think that I hope this cartoon is 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 clear. But uh, at the first time we we discussed this idea with our experimental friends, they didn't quite believe that because uh, it seemed very natural that you, one must remove mass to 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 make to to break two to, two particles apart, right? But then so they went again to to look at their images, and it's very interesting because you can pinpoint different atomic planes throughout the whole process, and they can actually count how many atomic planes you have from one specific position to another. And they can actually see right away that through the process, you are actually moving atoms in this direction of this region. So you really reverse the mass flux. You increase in the number of atomic planes here. So the mass flux is reversed. This is another key idea. Uh, and well, we did a very uh, simple and uh, but easy to understand uh, uh, thermodynamic model to explain that. I don't think I have time to, to go through that, but it's very simple. The idea is to look through the, the energy balance of, uh, of the process in which you have uh, mass flux in the system. So, and you also have uh, tensile strain, right? So uh, if you make this bridge thinner and thinner, you increase <clears throat> you increase the the surface area uh, and, and decrease the interface area. So since surface energy is, is usually it's more favorable, right? To to have a a, a, a larger uh, 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 grain boundary. Uh, so that's why the, the the usual process is actually the reverse is this sintering, but when you add an external uh, tensile stress, you make your energy balance, uh, and you realize that uh, for for a given uh, critical uh, stress, which is uh, actually called the sinter, is very much related to the sintering potential of of the classical description of sintering. There's, so there's a critical center, uh, sorry, there is a critical tensile stress, which makes it more favorable to actually add uh, atoms from a, a reservoir to the bridge. And, th and the, the, the key role played by these atoms are actually to relieve this stress moment, uh, 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 in, in a certain uh, amount of time. So uh, you by, by adding more atomic planes in this region, you relieve the stress and this saves you energy. And that's the main uh, idea behind this model. All right, <clears throat> uh, so going through now the, the very final uh, steps of the breaking, we have, as I said, uh, a formation of a ultra thin monatomic uh, wire. And let's focus on that regime for a while and understand in a little bit more detail uh, the structure and, and the dynamics of the, the wire uh, stability and, and formation. So let's start with experiments. At some point, you see there's a distance between two zirconium atoms of 3.8 ang angstrom. And there is a very a complex sequence of atomic rearrangements that lead uh, this uh, distance to 4.2. Angstroms, okay, and uh, it reaches 4.3 until it breaks. We have started with two very ideal models of uh, uh, ionic chains of uh, zirconium oxide. They, they, the first model, it, it keeps the uh, ZrO2 stoichiometry, and if you do this and you apply uh, a tensile strain to it, you see that. Uh, the zirconium-zirconium distance starts to increase as the force increases. 
until it breaks, but it breaks as a, at a very short, like 3.6, 3. Uh, 3, roughly 3.6 angstroms. And so it cannot explain this result in which you see very large uh, zirconium zirconium distances of 4.3 angstrom. So if you, if you hypothetically uh, uh, consider the presence of uh, oxygen vacancy in the system, and you see this structure, this structure you can strain it un until you reach very large distances of, uh, of uh, roughly 4.6 angstroms, very much compatible with this risk. So uh, our hypothesis is that this uh, very, uh, this complex se sequence of atomic rearrangements eventually lead to a formation of an oxygen vacancy in the system that is the very final process of, uh, uh, of wire formation before it breaks. So these are our results from quasi-static pooling simulations. It points, they point out the formation of atomic vacancies, but it's also interesting to consider possible dynamic effects. So these are all DFT calculations, okay? So how about the dynamics? Can vacancy form spontaneously, even in a, in a wire in which you have a perfectly uh, stoichiometric ZRO2? So for that, we did ab initio molecular dynamics simulations. Uh, we did we have a model bridge here, and you're pulling these two walls apart, and let's see how it goes. So you can see that uh, well, green, green is zirconium, red is oxygen. You see that eventually it will lead to the formation of an oxygen break, vacancy here at the bridge. And they actually even switches from one to the other uh, uh, until it eventually breaks. So we repeated these simulations many times. You always see this sort of uh, uh, process before breaking. So we have very much confidence that uh, the final uh, process of uh, wire breaking uh, involves the formation of um, oxygen vacancy in the system. So there's another way to understand this uh, in, in, in uh, um, using uh, energy concepts and, and it, in a way, it's very similar to uh, what we are used to do for three-dimensional solids in which we have two different constraints of const You can analyze a certain phase transition, for instance, from sil diamond silicon to beta tin silicon. Uh, you can analyze this either at constant volume conditions, conditions or constant pressure conditions. So if you, if you do constant volume, which is not usually what experimentally can be done, but if you, if you hypothetically use the idea of con uh, constant volume, you see that uh, as soon as, as you start to increase in pressure or decreasing volume, the transition between uh, diamond silicon and beta tin silicon hap uh, happens right here at this volume in which the two total energy curves uh, cross, right? But if you use the, co the condition of constant pressure, then what you have to minimize is the entropy. And there's a, the equivalent construction of that is using this uh, uh, so-called uh, common tangent uh, method in which you, you find the common tangent between the two curves. And this uh, slope defines the critical pressure for the transition between the two phases. And uh, when you reach this pressure, there's a sudden and discontinuous jump from this volume of diamond silicon to this one of beta tin silicon. So this is our, I mean, well-known in 3D solids. So how can you apply these ideas to this uh, 1D structure, which is a monatomic wire? So uh, again, we consider two phases or two structures. One is a, a pristine uh, a ZRO2 uh, wire. And the other one is a defective uh, wire with a, a, a oxygen vacancies. And, you do, again, these different uh, total energy curves, and we explore the two situations of constant. Uh, uh, now, it, now it can be either constant length or constant force, right? This is the equivalent of constant volume and constant pressure in 3D. Uh, it's slightly more complicated than that because uh, the two systems don't have the same uh, number of atoms of the same sort. So if you remove an atom, you also have to consider uh, where is this oxygen atom going to? Uh, so we have it at some point to define uh, 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 oxygen chemical potential and you have two different extreme, extremes 
of uh, oxygen rich and oxygen poor conditions that we properly took into account. So, well, so in the end of the day, you have four different theoretical situations that we can analyze, oxygen rich or oxygen poor with constraints of length and constant length or constant force, right? And for all these four different variations, what we can actually compare, try to compare to experiment is the bond length variation, how much the bond, the zirconium zirconium distance, how much it changes uh, when you introduce uh, an oxygen vacancy. Remember that we have this information from experiments right here. So it jumps from 3.8 roughly to 4.2 angstroms. And uh, we assume this is a result from the formation of an oxygen vacancy. So we, we again, we have these predictions from theory and we try to compare with experimental result. And uh, well, uh, if we're very, uh, uh, with a grain of salt, you actually uh, uh, conclude that the, the one that resembles mostly this guy here is the, the oxygen rich condition with constant length uh, constraint. So we propose that this is actually uh, the experimental situations in, in which uh, these experiments are, are, are happening. Okay, so that's the final conclusion. And I think I don't have more slides and that's it. So again, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Professor, Professor Rodrigo Rapaz, thank you so much for the presentation. We are now open to questions. If you want to participate, please enable your microphone or write it down at the chat and we will read it. Also, our YouTube viewers can write it down. May I start? Sure, go ahead, Professor Fred. Rodrigo, thank you for, for your presentation. Very, very interesting for us. And also, uh, we may talk later on uh, about how we can uh, uh, collaborate with the nano uh, facility. Mm -hmm. I think it was very interesting. Great. And we have a lot of projects that maybe you can use uh, and collaborate, change information. That's very nice. Uh, mm -hmm. One one question is, um, uh, I think you once already uh, all your calculation you use DGFT or you mix uh, quantum mechanical calculation with molecular dynamics. Is it? Uh, how, yeah. What, did so you use DF, mm -hmm, DGFT in 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 a part or or is a uh, uh, an equilibrium or? Uh, set state DFT, and and when we need something but more dynamic, you use molecular dynamic with DFT calculation. Is it? So I'm when correct. you say DDFT, uh, we are talking about uh, MD uh, DFT, molecular dynamics uh, simulations using uh, DFT uh, uh, description of uh, no, uh, I mean, electron uh, non equilibrium uh, quantum mechanical calculation, but use oh, DFT. Okay. Is it? No, no, no. We always at, at the quantum at the electronic level, we are always in equilibrium. So we are always at the okay. Born-Oppenheimer uh, energy surface. Yes, okay. Yes. So, uh, so when you have some dynamic, you use uh, 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 molecular dynamics with uh, Caparinello uh, approach. Yes. Yeah, it's not Carparinello, but it's equivalent uh, to that uh, in the sense that uh, well, we have uh, uh, Hellman Feynman forces on on the on the different atoms. Uh, Carparinello is slightly different because it it does uh, ionic and electronic degrees of freedom dynamics at the same uh, uh, simultaneously, uh, even though uh, is a way to go through to the Born-Oppenheimer surface. So there are many different ways. To, to go to the to the Mono-Penheimer surface, uh, which is, again, uh, keeping the ions fixed and uh, relaxing all, minimizing all the, the electronic coordinates. Uh, and in this, in this particular code that we use, uh, which is, I think, uh, uh, quantum espresso, uh, they do that, uh, I think, using the conjugate gradient minimization technique 
for fixed uh, ionic positions, and then you relax all, all your electronic coordinates. And from that, you have forces on the different ions, and you move the ions classically uh, using, I mean, regular MD simulations mm -hmm. using uh, 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 Newton's law. And, uh, and, and, and then we redo all the process for all the different time steps of, of your MD simulations. That's, that's basically how that is done. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, you're talking about uh, energy, uh, you, you talk about a potential energy, not a free energy, is it? That's true. Yeah. So we, we're talking about, uh, it's a jargon that uh, we use. When you say uh, total energy, it's very misleading because it really means that zero energy uh, 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 kinetic. Uh, uh, so it's zero. It, it doesn't include kinetic energy of the ions. Okay. It includes electronic uh, uh, energy, potential energy of electrons and, and ions in interaction. And, uh, and the kinetic energy of the electrons. So uh, it's not free energy in the sense that we don't have a finer temperature. Uh, uh, and, uh, and yeah, that's it. We don't even have a, a, a um, zero point energy. So uh, it's internal energy, I think is the, the correct way to say. But we, okay. it, we usually say total energy, but it's really misleading term. Okay, I, I got it. No. <laughs> Uh, uh, let us ask, uh, when you measure this information, uh, you have a lot of fluctuation because you are very non-scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so your observation is a median of several observations or you are trying to describe uh, a few number of observations? Uh, so, yeah, I, you're... you're you're talking about the, this experimental measurements, yes, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so they don't actually perform average. You see, there's a lot of fluctuations here. Uh, this is for the particular case in which they are analyzing the width of this bridge as a function of time. Yeah. And they don't do any averaging, uh, but uh, you see, there's a, there's a roughly linear behavior, but on top of that, there are some fluctuations. And uh, at, yeah, we have some ideas of trying to analyze the reason, uh, oh, of course there's this uh, uh, thermal uh, induced uh, fluctuations, but we haven't uh, done much work in trying to analyze uh, if there's any information you can have uh, from these fluctuations, but we really focused on the more like the average behavior. Okay. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Fred. <clears throat> Can I? Uh, go some... ahead, Professor Roger. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Capas, for presenting such fantastic facilities. He really makes us very optimistic about progress of science in Brazil. Thank you. You know, we are kind of a, the seminars we always feel everything is done abroad. Done abroad. Mm -hmm. We never realize very close to us, such a fantastic facilities are available. So I'm really happy to hear a talk and make me very optimistic. Thank uh, you. The other the two comments I, I, I want your thing. One is you said about dynamic behavior of this breaking. There's a flux of particles towards the bridge, mm -hmm. mass flux. Yes. Okay, basically oxygen or vacancy. It's not very clear which is moving there. The, the question is, do you feel it reaches a local steady state or that's why it's a lifetime is longer or it is, a, there's no such thing. It's something like Ansagar type of thing, local steady state or that's no an local steady state. That's an excellent question because we, we, we thought very much about this question which is it's a it's, it's sort of a critically uh, a critical balance between strain and mass flux because if you think about it if if you keep these two walls fixed let's say you fix the strain right 
then there's a mass flux that will eventually uh, um, uh, uh, relieve this strain and it will lead to sintering, right? So we have to have a very uh, precise uh, rate of moving these two walls apart in a way that you are always in, in a sort of, uh, 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 it's not equilibrium, it's a quasi equilibrium situation in which the, the mass flux and the rate in which you pull keep you a balance that uh, leads to a sort of a quasi equilibrium uh, uh, situation with strain. It's not equilibrium because if you, if you, if you stop pulling, it, it will not, eventually particles will move to this region and, uh, and uh, uh, synthes, synth, make sintering, right? So it, that's a very interesting question and, uh, and we have not addressed that in detail, but we are thinking about how to, to address that. Uh, uh, if you go to those equations here, uh, I didn't emphasize this too much, but th this is a, a variation in, in free energy. Uh, and it has different terms. It has the surface energies, and et cetera, and it has the stress. Uh, and it, it's a very, uh, you see, it, 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 uh, it, the variation in free energy as you uh, change the number of atoms in your system, okay? So, and this can be either positive or negative, depending if your if your if your stress is larger or smaller than a certain constant. So if, if so, if you have a larger stress, uh, tensile stress, then atoms will move towards the bridge. If you have a, a smaller than the critical value, then the opposite process will happen. So the dynamics of that is again very interesting, and uh, uh, it depends on. Uh, on, on things that we have actually not uh, included in this uh, uh, simple description, which is the rate of pulling and the, the rate of uh, a, a, a mass flux. So if you want to describe the dynamics, uh, uh, the true dynamics of this, you have to, to include these two rates. And uh, this is an interesting problem, but uh, we didn't have time to, to address that. Uh, I don't know if I was clear, yeah. Oh, it's very, uh, thank you. There's one more question here. When you talk of flux, you're talking of only of zirconium, for example, in this case, oxygen or vacancies also. Yeah, uh, we believe, yeah, we believe we cannot uh, change too much the, the charge balance. So we believe that, uh, of course, there may be some uh, local uh, uh, changes in stoichiometry, even the presence of the surface may lead to, to different stoichiometries, but as a whole, we believe that we don't see any formation of like a metallic zirconium phase or anything like that. So we believe that in, in roughly we must keep the ZRO2 stoichiometry during the, the whole process, roughly. So if there's change, if, if there's mass flux, they, they should have uh, ZRO2 units uh, 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 coming or leaving the the the, uh, the bridge region. Uh, the other question is about not about your work. Your comments on liquid state. You talked about Rayleigh instability, oil flow. You showed some pictures also. Yes. Droplets. Uh, the question there is uh, the surface tension. The surface mm -hmm. tension at small sizes may be a function of size and shape, besides yes. the temperature and pressure. Mm -hmm. Like Tolman's correction, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that nano droplets, nano bubbles, will have similar instabilities? Yeah. So it's a, a very good point. I mean, uh, uh, the the rail instability uh, and the the relevance of it. Uh, in this context, it's really uh, uh, was put together by different authors in, in the early 2000s. And it was really, uh, uh, when you talk about macroscopic objects, solid macroscopic objects, in which uh, you can use the same ideas of minimizing surface energy and not caring too much about surface orientation or surface stoichiometry or, or other uh, uh, things that are actually very important 
when you go to the nanoscale. So the, the, the whole point here is actually to, to, to uh, point out how different it is when you go to the nanoscale and specifically you, you, you're very much locked here at specific uh, facets or surface orientations. And this will eventually lead to the fact there is no instability. You, see, you don't see any instability here. You, you see a very stable bridge until the very final steps of a single atom, right? So it, again, it's, the, the beauty of this work is actually to point out uh, uh, that at the nanoscale, well, this, we know that already, but then, again, for this specific example, to point out that at the nanoscale, things behave very differently than predicted what, what, uh, at the macro scale. So you feel that you can still continue to use Laplace pressure equation, the classical one, or you have to have some surface phase like Gibbs in the case of liquid state. I don't know very much about Laplace uh, pressure effect, but I think it's a continuous uh, pro continual approach, right? Uh, right. It's like, uh, uh, so yeah, I, I think it's very hard to use this uh, in this case, I think, because uh, uh, I don't know, I, I wouldn't know too much about how to comp uh, make it compatible with the fact that uh, we actually have a, a, a atomic structure in, in your system, which translates into uh, facets of very well-defined orientation. I have not thought too much about it, but this is my feeling. Thank you very much. It is fantastic. Hope one day we can visit your laboratories. You are all and, welcome uh, to come well, here. Yeah, thank you sure. very much. And uh, uh, so close uh, to us. Thank you. Yes, yes. And uh, one of the things I think I noticed that uh, even when I was at uh, at uh, UFRJ, is that people don't really know us here at CNPEN too well. People, I think, they know the series, but uh, not even the series in detail. So the the key uh, one of the the, the objectives of this talk is actually to get us uh, well known and to, again, to emphasize that we are open, an open facility that anyone in Brazil and abroad can use. Uh, it's really fantastic. Uh, we agreed about newspaper or something is going on, but yes. we never know it got completed and so much work is being done. It's functioning. This is a great, great surprise to us. Great. Thank you. I don't see any more questions from the audience in the chat, so our time is almost over. I want to thank everyone for the discussion, and once again, thank you, Professor Rodrigo, for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, again, uh, if you want to discuss uh, poss possible collaborations and projects, uh, you all have my, my contact, my email, and I will be glad uh, uh, if you guys can come down here and visit us and work together with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rodrigo. So our seminars are being recorded and posted on YouTube, of course, after the invited Black Shoes Agreement. Please check them out on our YouTube channel. Okay. okay. This is our organization committee. We are responsible for inviting and communicating with the lecturers. We also Rainbow, social media video editing, certificate writings, and hosting. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, we'll meet again uh, next Thursday on the seminar that will be given by Professor Matias. See you all there. Thank you.